We're going to start the second part uh, of this uh, session dedicated to the metropolis in Latin America. My name is Idur Alonso. I'm Associate Curator of Latin American Collections at the Getty Research Institute and co-curator of uh, the metropolis in Latin America. As uh, Maristela pointed out a moment ago, uh, in the first round with the two speakers, we talk about the cultural background of the 19th century. We talked about the colonial city and the changes. And now we're going to go into two uh, major uh, cities that get transformed during this period, which are uh, Rio and, and Buenos Aires. Our speaker, next speaker, is Maria Cristina da Silva Leme, who is an architect, urbanist, and professor at the School of Architecture and Urbanism at University of Sao Paulo. Her research interests focus on history of urban and regional planning and urbanization process in Brazilian and Latin American cities. And she is the editor of the book Urbanismo no Brasil, 1895-1965, among many other publications. So uh, welcome, Maria Cristina. Okay, so I will, I will I start uh, uh, to say thank you to Maristela and Eduhi and uh, to congratulate with the Getty Institute because this is really an amazing symposium. You have uh, you. You have renewed uh, a lot of researchers that the, the previous day and now, I think that it will be a great discussion. I propose to talk about uh, the role of Latin American and foreign architects and engineers in transforming the cities I choose and uh, the cities that uh, Maristela and Iduhi proposed, I choose uh, two, uh, of, to, to see the differences and the similarities. So I choose Rio de Janeiro in Brazil and uh, Buenos Aires in Argentina. And I will try to uh, explain why I choose these two cities. As you can see here, these are two avenues. The right one, it's in Buenos Aires, the Avenida de Mayo. And at the left side, it's Avenida Central in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, the image uh, the, uh, of these two uh, avenues, they came with the urban reforms. The, this, this new avenue came with the urban reforms in these two Latin American cities. Uh, as you can see in the photos, uh, this it was being designed uh, a new city with broader streets, aligned houses, squares, and parks. And these changes, uh, which were carried out in a selective way and adapted to local conditions, were based on the broad reforms made by Rosemann in Paris and Otto Wagner in Vienna. This is something that I would like to discuss. At what, uh, what is the extension of these, of the reforms that were taken in the Latin American cities, uh, they resemble as the reform in Paris. So, the image of this 
avenues, uh, we can see that Paris is in the background of the design of these new streets. But the reforms that come with this uh, enlargement of the streets are different in Rio de Janeiro and in Buenos Aires. And it, this is something that we are going to see. But at the same time, uh, both cities have a new economic, political, and social context. Uh, they both have the remodeling, the remodel of the ports. They m both have new railroad system. They both have uh, new lines of tramways that were important in both cities. There is a gradual decentralization process through the, cons the construction of this railroad, of this tramway, and the remodel of the ports. I will begin with Rio de Janeiro. This is a map, i sorry, this is the map, it's in my computer. This is the map of Rio de Janeiro. As you, this is the map of the central part of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, but it was the, 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 the city at that time. As you can see, uh, Rio de Janeiro has, uh, it's a, a city with a topography uh, very, very, uh, uh, you have the, you, you can see that we have these mounts in the city and they were very important at that time to build this new avenue it was necessary to dis dismount, to demolish this mount. And in 1923, this one was also, uh, how do you say that, demolished? No, demolished for, for constructions. They were completely uh, raised, yes, with water. They just... So, the political, economical, and social context of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, Rio de Janeiro was very important for the Portuguese Empire since uh, 1808, when the uh, when the, the cut of Portugal. Portugal came to Brazil, they were fleeing from the Napoleon uh, uh, invasion. And so Rio de Janeiro became the capital of the Portuguese empire. In 1822, Brazil is independent of uh, Portugal and Rio de Janeiro was the capital of the new reign. In 1889, the new Republican regime is established and Rio de Janeiro continue to, see, to be the capital of Brazil. Uh, at that time, we have a passage, a passage of an agricultural to an industrial economy, and something that is very important uh, is that we had, until then, the, uh, the slavery was, uh, the, the slave labor was very important in Brazil, and we have in 1888 the abolition of slavery. So, as you can see here, you have the uh, slaves in a coffee farm. You have, this is a picture made by Jean-Baptiste Debré, who came to Rio de Janeiro with the Portuguese court in the, and he, I think that this is a very good uh, portrait of the ambiguity of the social 
and economic conditions of a society that was based on the labor, on the slave labor. Uh, as you can see now, they were the presence of these slaves were, were in the streets. They were, these were after the abolition of the slavery. They were free women and free men that were uh, in the city. They were, uh, the, the, its present was very, uh, its present in the city. They have, uh, they were working in the public space. They were working for their masters. So this is a social aspect that uh, distinguish uh, Rio de Janeiro and other Brazilian cities from uh, the Latin American cities and also from the European city. From 1860, we have an accelerated expansion of the city. They were largely controlled by foreign capital. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the British uh, f uh, financing the constructions of trains, on trains, lines, and these were responsible for the expansion of the city. Something that is important also to notice at this, it is that trams and trains, uh, the city grows in qualitatively different directions. This is the railroad central station, Central do Brasil. The new trains lines were built in the rural area. Uh, houses were built along the railroad with higher concentration around the stations. And little by little, streets were open along the railroad by small companies and landowners. As you can see here, uh, let me explain a little the geography of Rio de Janeiro. This is the Bahia de Guanabara. This is the center of the city. And these are the new railroad lines. And these are all the stations that were. I, I'm not talking the, the microphone, sorry, sorry. So, let's start again. So, this is the Bahia de Guanabara. This is the old part of the city. And these are the railroads that they were constructed for economic reasons to bring coffee to the port, but at the same time, they became passenger lines. So, as you can see, you have these stations along the line, and these stations became the beginning of the suburbs of Rio de Janeiro. And they are, until today, they are very important for the expansion of the city, but also to be the, uh, the new spaces for the, the new residential spaces for the middle class that, begins, that began at that time. This is a caricature, uh, caras e caretas. No, sorry, this is not Caras e Caretas, it's from Buenos Aires. This is Omalho, it's a, 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 a review from Rio de Janeiro. And this is the conflict entered the urban zone and the suburb. They are talking about the people who lived in the suburb and the people who could live in the city. And this is what I was uh, talking about 
the beginning of, in 1868, the introduction of the tramways lines and the displacement of the upper income classes to this new neighborhood where they have the trams, they have water supply, the sewage system. So this is an articulation between this infrastructure, the transport, the water, the sewage, and and after the beginning of the 19th century, also the electric light. So we have in uh, this time in Rio de Janeiro, a difference entre the city, the central city, this expansion to new suburbs that were uh, occupied by the uh, high income classes, and the suburbs that, was, that were along the train lines. This is an image of the, uh, around 1880, of uh, the way that the port was uh, the, the way of the port was in Rio de Janeiro at that time. You see that through these little boats, they made the transport enter the market and the large boats that were in the Bahia. So this is the image of a port that was very, uh, with great problems to uh, do this kind of service. So the, this is the port and this is the, an image of the central part of the uh, Rio de Janeiro. Well, from nineteen three to nineteen six we have the major urban reforms in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, they have a new mayor, Pereira Passos, and during this period, two actions were, uh, two actions of urban reform took place. The first was designed by the federal government, was the modernization of the port of Rio de Janeiro, and the second, plan by the municipality, was brought and sought to integrate the various regions of the city to the urban center. This, sorry. Well. They have two complementary objectives. The first, to improve the urban circulation. The second, to promote aesthetic and hygienic conditions for urban buildings and the avenues were the most important instrument of this plan. It was designed to transform the capital of the Republic into a modern city. This is a map of the Rio de Janeiro with the improvements made by Mayor Pereira Passos. It's a map of 1905. As you can see in red, this, they, they are highlighting the avenues. Here is the port, the new port. Here is the Avenida Central. And here are the new avenues, the avenues Beira Mar, that link the center of the city with the new neighborhoods that are in the coastal area. This is going to the south part of the city. Uh, well, this is Botafogo 
And Copacabana, that uh, you probably heard about, it's beyond that. So, it's important to see what, what are these urban reforms. They, take, they were made in... Uh, here is the Mayor Pereira Passos. And they were made this, the, again, Avenida Central. The Avenida Central was opened in record time. The demolitions began on February 29, 1904. And at September, so six, seven months, the new avenue was already open and they have the electric tramway and they, to build this new avenue, they have to demol demolish 500 buildings. This is uh, the plan of the new avenue. I don't know if you can see, but this shows you the the new buildings that are highlighted, and you can see the old part of the city that was, that have been demolished. This is another view. You can see there the Pão de Açúcar, the sugar loaf. So this is the new avenue. And new buildings were also uh, this is the uh, Teatro Municipal, the Municipal Theatre. This is the P P Palacio Monro. So, you have a new image of a city. And these are the suburbs at that time. So, now we are going to pass to Buenos Aires very quickly. Um, Buenos Aires became, it's, 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 an, it's a different, uh, uh, different uh, situation uh, entre Buenos Aires and Rio de Janeiro. Rio de Janeiro was the capital of the empire. Buenos Aires became the capital of Argentina only in 1880 and after a long period of conflict enter the national government, the provincial authorities, and the municipalities. Uh, to become a federal capital, Argent uh, Buenos Aires received uh, a new, uh, received this new territory from the uh, the province, provinces that limited with it. So this was the uh, this, the old Buenos Aires, and after it became the federal capital, this was the new territory of Buenos Aires. As to Rio de Janeiro, three, uh, three, uh, the port, the railroad, and became become the federal capital was the triggering uh, factors that changed uh, Buenos Aires. Around 1870, they have to decide the location of a new port the develop, development of a railroad system and the establishment of Buenos Aires as a federal capital. The decision about the new location of the port, you see here, we have three different projects at that time, and they decided uh, 
they decided in favor of the proposal presented by Eduardo Madero. And this had an impact on the urban structure of Buenos Aires. It directed the development of the cities toward the Plaza de Mayo, a place of prestige, power, and wealth of the cities, of the city. The railroad, the, the development of a railroad system in Buenos Aires was they have first three rails followed paths led down by ox cart and mule trains, and they have terminals of southern western lines were established near the marketplaces and they reinforced the existing commercial and transportation infrastructure. Sorry. I think that this came. In 1894, the municipality of Buenos Aires prepared a plan de mejoras, and the plan proposed the grid, which allowed the control of urbanization over the whole municipality, and overlaid the grid a system of parks and a hierarchical network of great avenues that connected the station of the city, the stations of railroad, and the great public buildings. Jorge uh, show it as the, the grid, as a pattern that allowed to expand the city, uh, the, to, to have a room to expand the city. This is thing, at least I, I think it's a very important idea. In the, uh, in the context of the preparation of the works of the celebration of the centenary of emancipation of Argentina in 1910, the municipality decided to contract the French architect Joseph Antoine Bouvard. He was the former director of the 19 Paris exhibition. So, uh, Bouvard, uh, he was one, uh, he, he has worked with Alphonse uh, during the transformation of Paris. So he has this expertise of uh, doing this, the Grand Travaux de, de Paris, but also he has worked in this, uh, the exhibition of 19. Uh, in Paris, where uh, Paris in itself was uh, the, uh, the exhibition of a new modern metropolis. So they contracted Bouvard to come to, to Buenos Aires and to direct the new plan for the city. This is the new plan, but it was not made only by Bouvard, but there was also a commission of local technicians. Uh, Bouvard has a very interesting role in this plan. And it, it's uh, interesting because we have, uh, it was almost the same that he done in Sao Paulo, Brazil, at the same time. Uh, he gave, he ensured the consistency to the plan. Uh, there was 
uh, a diversity of projects at that time. And so, Bouvard, his, he articulated and composed the proposals that was in dispute and presented a new urbanistic proposal that combined the different proposals. So this plan, I am going to back. This plan, as you can see, uh, let me show you. This is the port area. This is the area that was really occupied at that time. And they proposed uh, over the grid dia dia diagonals, <laughs> diagonais, <laughs> las diagonales, uh, that linked the different parts of the city. So, this is not my, my uh, uh, this is uh, uh, the th thesis of a uh, historian, uh, an Argentinian architect and historian, uh, Adrian Gorelik. What is, what is his uh, thesis about the, the plan proposed by, uh, by Bouvard, that first, you have the grid as a way of occupying the territory. So, you can see very, very, it's not very highlight, but there is the grid in all the territory of Buenos Aires. And they proposed these avenues, and also they proposed a system of plazas, parks. So this, uh, you can see here the great uh, park. So this was uh, a proposal that has the grid the, that it's a characteristic of the uh, colonization, the Spanish colonization, with a new proposal that linked and made this new network of avenues and plazas and parks. These are the elements of the plan proposed by Joseph Antoine Bouvard, the plazas and the parks, the road system, the monuments. These are the main aspects of his plan. Here you have the Avenue de, de Mayo, and this is the Plaza de Mayo. I think that the Plaza de Mayo shows very well the uh, new symmetric and the new aesthetic that uh, is proposed by uh, Joseph Antoine Bouvard. Well, now I have the final remarks. Well, there are differences and similarities entered the urban reforms of Rio de Janeiro and Buenos Aires. First, the difference entered the interventions implemented in grid-shaped cities, such as Buenos Aires, then on top of a irregular layout that had been adapted to the local topography as Rio de Janeiro. Second, the gradual expansion to the suburbs. Four, the role of the local professionals and foreign experts in, proposal, in proposing and implementing urban reforms. Uh, 
In Rio de Janeiro, we had Pereira Passos. He was an engineer. He made his studies in Paris at the Col de Pons de Chaussée. He was, uh, he started working in the tramway company and the railroad company, and then he became the mayor. In Buenos Aires, we have Bouvard, but as I said before, he was not working alone. He was working with a commission of local uh, experts. I think that this is important to discuss the circulation of ideas, the circulation of models, and to understand the importance of the local tech, the local experts, and the foreign experts. Here, a, a caricature of Baris Baron Hausman. Uh, this is the Intendant de Alvear and Pereira Passos in Rio de Janeiro. Thank you. So now we're going to go with uh, our last uh, speaker. Um, and he's going to talk about the impact of, reconsider and, uh, of these reconsiderations of the local past. And we're talking about Mexico. Yesterday, as we were uh, going through Golden Kingdoms, Kim Richter asked the question of why it was important to put together exhibitions about uh, pre-Hispanic art and have discussions about it. And I think uh, Cristobal's presentation is a great answer to that question. Lord. <laughs> Cristobal uh, Jacome Moreno is a PhD candidate in art history at the University of Texas at Austin. He publishes primarily on modern art, architecture, and visual culture in Mexico. His current research focuses on mid-century architecture and its connection to the pre-Columbian past. And his latest publication is Ida Rodriguez Prampolini, La Crítica de Arte en el Siglo XX. Thank you. Thank you, Idurre, and thank you, Maristela, for inviting me to participate in this fascinating project. Um, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, Porfirio Diaz regime, 1876-1910, was characterized by the adoption of positivist ideals that spoke to notions of order and progress. Ulti ulti ultimately, the belief in these ideas resulted in a period of relative national peace, industrial development, a massive improvement in infrastructure, and the use of new technologies in Mexico City. The cultural politics of Dina's Dina's tenure, widely known as Porfiriato, sought to revalue and revive Mexico's indigenous past. In the past, previous governments had used the nation's pre-Columbian history to channel notions of national identity. But it was only with Diaz that an institutionalized effort began to regulate ancient objects. As such, state-sponsored archaeological excavations, particularly regarding as the culture, established the origins of a new kind of nationalism. As noted by Claudio Lomnitz and Mauricio Tenorio Trillo, a political and cultural intelligentsia closely tied to Diaz regime saw so as the culture as a means to uproot Mexico's deepest historical origins so that the glory of a mythical past could match the many presidential achievements. Here, I, I examine the modern representations of Mexico's pre-Columbian past as seen in, Mexi in Mexico City's urban landscape and its subsequent promotion of Mexican ideals outside the country. I will begin by focusing on the monument to Cuauhtémoc, the last Aztec emperor. In his second year as president in 80, 1877, Diaz ordered the construction of a sculpture promenade on Reforma Avenue. This longest street had, built, had been built during Maximilian's empire in order to link the imperial residence, the Chapultepec Castle, with the city's downtown. Maximilian did not envision Reforma Avenue as a modern boulevard in Haussmann's terms. 
This period, however, saw the street's expansion and renovation as a format was reconceived to make Mexico City look like a modern cosmopolitan city that could relish on its, on its past history through bronze sculptures. The first monument commemorated Christopher Columbus in 1877, a joint venture with French sculptor Charles Cotier. In response to Columbus' glorification, Diaz also commissioned a sculpture to praise an Aztec leader. Thus, Cuauhtémoc's monument was proposed. But differences soon arose between the president and the minister for development, historian Vicente Riva Palacio, and the statue was only completed until 1887. The sculpture was ultimately commissioned to Miguel Noreña, while engineer Francisco Jimenez was charged with working on the monument's foundation. Unlike other 19th century representations of Cuauhtémoc, which depict the Aztec emperor being tortured and defeated by the Spanish conquerors, Reformas Cuauhtémoc extols the emperor's strength and resistance to the European colonizers. Wearing a Roman tunic and carrying a spear on his right hand, Cuauhtémoc's figure is at once emperor and warrior. The monument's pyramid-like foundation depicts a symbolic transition between a vanquished indigenous leader and a legendary hero who defended the Aztec city of Tenochtitlan. The inferior reliefs narrate Cortes' encounter with Cuauhtémoc and also depict the Aztec emperor's torture. Here, the passerby can observe two crucial scenes in Cuauhtémoc's official narrative, his honorable behavior before the enemy and the dramatic episode of his betrayal. The second segment describes the indigenous courage. Also featured are the names of Huitlagua, Cacama, Conauch, and Tlepe Tlepepanquetzal, four chieftains who died along Cuauhtémoc defending Aztec communities. The emperor's military feats are immortalized on neoclassical columns that hold the pedestal for the ever triumphant Cuauhtémoc. The monument is thus an urban space that retells both an episode of national history under a new Porphyrian light and offers a counter-narrative on one of the country's foundational figures. To the mostly illiterate society of the age, this monument would commemorate a hero of history through means and images that, that exalted only his heroic nature. Cuauhtémoc's renewed urban image of the Porfiriato is important for two reasons. First, the hero, his cultures, features a high-natured masculinity. Notions of virility and male empowerment were promoted and cultivated in the 19th century wars Mexico's engaged in. According to social and political conventions, masculinity was based on strength and courage to defend the masses against foreign invasions. As such, powerful army leaders would embody honor and masculinity. Cuauhtémoc's portrayal as a fighting warrior evokes the same image in the context of Mexico's 19th century imagination. Representing the Aztec, the Aztec hero served the, pur the purpose of linking his persona to the military leaders that defended Mexico on numerous occasions during the century. Diaz himself was a military strongman who fought during Mexico's French invasion in the famous Battle of Puebla on May 5, 1862. Indigenous involvement was crucial to this battle's success, but the monument does not celebrate indigenous militias. Instead, the sculptor capitalizes on the strength of renowned heroes of the fatherland. Secondly, Cuauhtémoc's sculpture sought to create a kind of national history in the figure of a indigenous hero. Accounts on Cuauhtémoc's life have existed since the 18th century but these versions had circulated without necessarily highlighting some central aspects of the emperor's life. The book Solemnidad en Honor de Cuauhtémoc provides important facts, such as the leader's birth date on August 20, 1496. The sculpture was unveiled that the same day in 1887. Cuauhtémoc became, as such, an official career of an ancient historic past an example of men who fought for national sovereignty. 
In the official chronicle regarding the monument's unveiling ceremony, writer Guillermo Valleto is adamant to show, quote, Temoc as Mexico's first fighter for an independent nation. According to Valleto, Mexico's official hero during the War of Independence, Miguel Hidalgo, owed Cuauhtémoc the idea of an autonomous fatherland and subsequent efforts to defend it. Valleto describes the unveiling ceremony as a massive event attended by 20,000 people in order to commemorate both Cuauhtémoc and Díaz. Díaz appeared as a revived version of Cuauhtémoc sitting on an ornate throne that recalls those of the ancient Aztec kings, while archaeologist Alfredo Chavero and Fra historian, uh, sorry, historian Francisco del Paso Troncoso delivered the key notes addresses. Poems were researched in Spanish and Nahuatl by Francisco Sosa, Dordo del Valle, and Chavero, praising Cuauhtémoc for defending la patria. A satirical cartoon published in independent newspapers, newspaper El Hijo Laguisote, was critical of this official event. Ironica, ironically entitled, Una Fiesta Cuauhtémoc, this drawing suggests that the official unveiling of the monument was an excuse to loathe Diaz. The critical outlook of quote, Mexico's independent press rendered the efforts in recreated pre a pre-Columbian scene useless and absurd. It was not only that reinventing the past amounted to the idea of progress, it quickly became apparent that Diaz wanted to emulate the sacred power of Aztec Latuanis, and these are other images that represent that. In the scene depicted in the magazine, Diaz is the protagonist, and Alfredo Chavero, head of Mexico City's municipality and well-known author of plays inspired pre columbian mythology, appears as a close intellectual surrogate. The scene imagines both men as Aztec warriors wearing Indian hairdresses and carrying shields. This ironic look into presidential power is crowned by the image of Cuatlicue, the serpent-faced Aztec goddess of Earth. If Cuatlicue was a major Aztec figure associated with the political apparatus, it was because of a change in perception within Porfirista elites regarding this peculiar sculpture. Since its discovery in the late 18th century, Cuatlicue had become a problematic figure frequently expressed about by intellectual elites because of her association to death and sacrifice. And this is a topic that Leonardo Lopez Luján, who is here, um, analyzes. So, however, intellectual elites in the late 19th century highlighted the goddess singularity as well as her, ab her ability to contest Western beauty ideals. In the landmark book, collection, Mexico a través de los siglos, from 1884, Chavero called Cuatlicue, quote, the most beautiful idol housed at the National Museum, end of quote. Like Cuauhtémoc, Cuatlicue became a myth in the Aztec repertoire that became reconceived by Porfirista elites in order to present Mexico's ancient past as grandiose. Diaz government decided to make Mexican history a monumental endeavor and that is the message it carried on at the Mexican Pavilion during Paris World Fair of 1899. Designed by architect Antonio de Anza and archeologist Antonio Peña Fiel, the Aztec Palace sought a direct dialogue with the monumentality of pre-Columbian pyramids and ancient sculptures such as Cuatlicue. In his book, Monumentos Antiguos Mexicanos, Peña Fiel included as part of a series of drawings and photographs, the design of the Aztec Palace. In that design, the archeologist will establish this building artistic genealogy and will show these hitherto unknown pieces to the European onlooker as a proof of mastering among pre-Hispanic civilization. Another important element in this work was the scholar's indication of the piece's dimensions under possibly the possible date of elaboration as a way to demonstrate these new Mexican pyramids, nationalism, in the light of the study and administration of ancient objects. Showing that the state was responsible for promoting archaeology, Peña Fiel sought to demonstrate Diaz government to demonstrate Diaz government commitment to science. Modern nations, he believed, study and preserve the pieces of their past. 
neglecting them will be, quote, an act of barbarism and condemnation to the scientific world. Peñafiel's ideas in Monumentos Antiguos Mexicanos were somehow put in practice at Aztec Palace main exhibit. The architect feature for the entrance, a replica of Coltemoc's monument flanked by pre-Columbian monoliths. In that way, Peñafiel reinforced his thesis that works of Mexican art had a direct connection to the monumentality of the ancient past and highlighted the notion that the state the state fostered intellectuality in keeping with the most technologically advanced countries. Mexico presents itself as such, as a nation of forward-looking ideas, but at the same time as a nation that also privileged a history rooted in indigenous civilizations. The Aztec Palace crystallized the links between scientific novelty and spectacle the glory of the pre-Hispanic past and the innovations of the industrial era. Without a doubt, Peñafiel knew that if Paris was a world-class city, Mexico City could respond with the dramatization and monumentality of its ancient heritage. On the importance of the palace, Mauricio Tenorio, Tenorio Trillo asserts that, quote, the palace was meant to highlight the great, though atypical, lineage of the nation. It represented a national entity with a glorious past, but ready to adjust to the dictates of cosmopolitan nationalism and eager to be linked to the international economy. The Aztec Palace will set the norm for subsequent Mexican exhibits at international fairs. In 18 in 1992, Madrid held the Exposición Histórico Americana, which commemorated the fourth centennial of Columbus' travels to the New World. The Mexican Pavilion was created by Alfredo Chavero, and then director of the National Museum of Mexico, Francisco del Paso, whose proposal included showing an overview of ancient Mexican, Mexican cultures, not just the Aztec. The result was an exhibit that featured the diversity of Mexico's pre-Hispanic civilizations, albeit in a homogeneous manner. For instance, a model of the Pyramid of Tajin, a Totonaca ceremonial building, was laid in between two sculptors of Aztec leaders, Cuitláhuac and Moctezuma. Another segment featured Aztec emperors Axayacatl and Cuauhtémoc, as well as a replica of Cuatlicue next to a Maya cross tablet from Palenque. This was to represent a sump up version of the National Museum, a diplomatic strategy that showcased pre-Hispanic art, not only as an example of the state's knowledge of the country's past, but indeed as the basis of modern national identity. Whereas these exhibits negotiated national identity abroad, in Mexico City, the monument to Cuauhtémoc served as a space to forge a sense of community out of the symbols of the past. On August 20, 1900, a group of children celebrated Mexico's indigenous legacy by performing a play at the monument's ground. Sponsored by the local government, this act featured Moctezuma's crowning by Cuauhtémoc and other Aztec military leaders. According to the media of the time, the children sang both poems in Nahuatl and Mexico's national anthem. This is an example of an expansive modernist project that sought to create a fixed repertoire of symbols to enhance the idea of nationality and civic culture for Mexico's citizenry. This was also to be a critical episode for the, go for the government. In order to counteract the criticism to Diaz's perpetuation of his government, the state launched a campaign to celebrate national history. According to government ministers and intellectuals, Mexico's civic model of the 20th century should keep respecting and exalting, exalting national symbols. Reforma Avenue was, by then, already a sculptural promenade filled with images of Mexican heroes and was thus the ideal space to worship the official history. On social cohesion, anthropologist Nestor Garcia Cancrilli maintains that, quote, the traditional values of the people assumed and represented by the state or by a charismatic leader legitimize the order that this administer and give the popular sectors the confidence that they are participating in a system that includes and recognizes them, 
End of quote. The ambitious attempts to fabricate Mexican national identity, both at home and abroad, will not occur again until the early 1920s. The long and violent process of the Mexican Revolution of the 1910s did not allow for the creation of large-scale projects that spoke to national identity, such as the Pasola Reforma or the Aztec Palace. The first effort to articulate the idea of Mexico outside the country took place in Rio de Janeiro in 1922. As part of Brazil's independence centennial, President, President Abel Obregón commissioned the pavilion project to, to education minister Jose Vasconcelos, the mastermind of the first stage of the muralist movement. Vasconcelos took on the project and went to great lengths to, to show that Mexico was proud of its bicultural origins and that a similar history was shared by other Latin American nations, such as Brazil. For Vasconcelos, the architectural style that could best represent a mixed race Latin American nation was the colonial, Californian, colonial Californiano or mission style, which reconceived Spanish cultural legacy from a modern aesthetics. On this basis, the Mexican Pavilion of Rio de Janeiro, designed by architect Carlos Bregón Santacilia, built on 17th century colonial architecture, clearly contrasting with the pre-Hispanic revivals. This not, don't, did not mean, of course, that Mexico's indigenous heritage was forgotten by Vasconcelos. Instead, the indigenous legacy of Mexico remained alive in the art and culture of the living indigenous populations. Mexico's pavilion in Brazil was thus a Vasconcelos opportunity to rebrand himself as the creator of the country's modern ideas of nationality, history, and, and ethnicity. Nonetheless, Mexico's political elites did not completely agree with Vasconcelos' project, especially Foreign Affairs Minister Alberto Pani. Unlike Vasconcelos, Pani thought that the country's pre-Hispanic legacy had to feature prominently at the pavilion and even suggested to send a cargo filled with ancient sculptures as a gift to the Brazilian government. This tension was resolved with a replica of Cuauhtémoc statue on Reforma. For Vasconcelos, the sculpture represented the old diplomatic strategies of Diaz government. Pani, however, thought that the statue signified a way to remind the world about Mexico's glorious history. When the monument was unveiled, Vasconcelos recounted the glories of the leader, but also stressed the distance he felt in relation to the Aztec past. Quote, it is clear that Mexico, in its idolization of Cuauhtémoc, does not intend to make way to progress. We cannot in any way pretend to go back to the Aztec's Stone Age, just as we cannot accept be like being a colony of any foreign nation again." End of quote. Vasconcelos' nationalism, built of a rejection of the past and in defense of the idea of a contemporary mestizaje, demonstrated that Diaz's cultural regime was still present. As such, the makeover of national symbols was neither an isolated incident nor it was lineal. To be sure, the post-revolutionary state was a system consolidated during the 1920s, but that did not mean that the idea of nation was clear-cut, both, both at home and abroad. We can talk about a, about a powerful state apparatus, but certainly not about an established or monolithic idea of nation. Mexico's pavilion for the Ibero-American Fair of Seville in 1929 represents the, the diversity of perspectives typical of the post-revolutionary post -revolutionary era. The Mexican government announced a prize for the design of Seville's pavilion, and the winner was Manuel Amabilis, an architect from Yucatan. Trained at the Ecole Supérieure de Beaux-Arts in Paris, Amabilis had developed since the 1910s a style based a style of architecture based on the form of ancient Maya temples. For the pavilion in Seville, Amabilis wanted to demonstrate that Maya art possessed the visual and sculptural sophistication needed in order to create a new architectural trend. 
This appropriation was called indigenismo, which meant not only appropriating the forms of the past, but indeed studying the architectural lessons of ancient civilizations in order to formulate a contemporary notion of aesthetics. His proposal satisfied intellectual elites that wanted to revalue Mexico's pre-Hispanic past in Spain. But there were critical voices that claimed that the project lacked a historical narrative that also should consider, consider the modern present. A contemporary of Amabilis, Francisco Mujica, who was not connected to the network of architects allied to the state, also studied the links between pre-Columbian architecture and contemporary practice. His 10-decade study, The History of the Skyscraper, is both a work of architectural history and a manifesto. The book thesis is that the skyscraper had, has its remote origins in the Mesoamerican pyramids, and, that, and the architects of today should embrace this tradition by applying the pre-Columbian sense of building an ornamentation to solve contemporary construction challenges. For him, the skyscraper was not just another type of building, but indeed a monument to Americanness, meaning both North America and South America. This is the image in which the history of the skyscraper concludes. Here, Mujica connects two different pre-Columbian architectural works to produce an utopian vision of cities. On the one hand, he presents the skyscrapers with major ornamentation to give a sense of regional belonging. On the other, he reshapes the extended urban composition of Teotihuacan, the monumental Aztec city in which Mujica had done excav excavations between 1926 and 1930. Clearly, the question of modernity for Mujica was resolved in the archaeological exploration of Mexico and how these ancient constructions had the potential to mark the vertical and horizontal growth of the metropolises. Also closely connected to the archaeological circles in Mexico, in the history of the skyscraper, Mujica did not instrumentalize his knowledge for the formation of pre-Columbian cities for a nation state project. His project instead proposed a, a, a new geographic imagery in which the spirit that built ancient Pamos cities is connected with economic forces that expanded them during the emergence of urban industrial capitalism. Mujica's massive and technological skyscrapers compel us to consider how the magnetism of ancient pyramids and monoliths mobilizes economic and aesthetic forces. His utopian proposals opens the questions about who owns the ancient past and what is the place it has in the future for the metropolises. Thus, the history of the skyscraper invites us to reflect on the contemporary interpretations we make about that perpetual past. Thank you. Most of the exhibition, really, 
one could say that the, the rural urban migration was not massive in general. Uh, I mean, you, you have, of course, regional movements, uh, for instance, in Brazil, so as far as I understand, with, uh, with the abolition of slavery in 1888. Of course, it implies some regional movements, uh, especially in the south, as far as I understand. And you could uh, have uh, movements in, in Uruguay, for instance, where, where, where the, where the um, sort of Bacchineas, the, the rural states, were um, sort of limited by, by, the, by the owners, and it implies some uh, displacement of, of groups towards the city, what they call the, it's a terrible uh, term, Ciudades de Rata, so it's a rat's uh, settlement. But, but what I'm trying to say is what not massive, it was, it was, it's okay now? <laughs> Uh, it was um, it wasn't massive, but the the foreign immigration was significant, of course. The foreign immigration, from <laughs> yes, from Europe, yes. Not rural uh, urban migration, but foreign immigration, especially in the southern one, because Argentina was emblematic, uh, South Brazil, uh, parts of Chile. Uh, but the, the rural uh, um, immigration you, you refer to, um, I think it became significant in the, at the end of the period we are, we are dealing with. I mean, in the 1920s, the 1910s, 1920s. This is when you will have really an impact in the demographic structure. And this is why I refer to Romero's concept of massa, of, of massive uh, ciudad pacificadas which is the ciudad or the city that comes after the bourgeois city. I mean, this ciudad massificada or mass city results from that immigration, precisely. Okay? Well, in general terms. Okay. 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 Okay.
with a cultural continuity. So this idea that there is, oops, oh. now it's working, that there is <laughs> yeah, it's an issue of continuity and uh, in cultural history, I think that it's something that it's revelatory in this, I mean, the proposal of the exhibition, but also the book that we are going to publish, because very often we see very comportamentalized history. Where here we see an history of long durée, which I think it's very interesting historiographically. Well, I, I think that one of the key aspects to understand this is that now we see Spanish American as a single entity, mm. but mm. the reality is that it was an enormous territory with very different populations from the, which is now Mexico, into Argentina. And in, in some cases, the cities were uh, built on top of older towns and cities, uh, like in the case of Mexico City or Cusco, and uh, the, the pre-existing tradition somehow, uh, you know, informed the colonial city. And this uh, idea of uh, order that they, they tried with the Leges de India, uh, it was really a bureaucratic approach to solve a very complex problem. And uh, for example, the. Uh, the role of nature in the in the cities has some presence in the in the Mexica. Uh, so we, we find uh, we have really experts here, but we have really uh, this idea of uh, zoological gardens and, and, and gardens and kind of green areas in the city that we have in Mexico City, and in in, the, in Cusco we have this garden of gold and silver at the Coricancha, you know, with mm. description. Of this wonderful space in which the nature had a role into the city. Uh, in other places, like uh, in, in Caracas, for example, that is, is it's a, it uses an example because it was really a, a city in the periphery. Um, there was nothing. There was no previous settlement really in the exact place. There were some little communities around in the mm -hmm. valley, but there was not really a settlement. This is when, when you see the grid, you see this really perfect grid mm. that they implemented. Um, and yes, uh, the, the, the relationship with nature, this love-fear with nature and, uh, and the Indians, uh, it's, it's, I think it's, it's kind of, of the key elements that we see, especially in the 1500s, when they're they are kind of trying to settle the different cities, and uh, and it was the unknown, you know. Uh, and uh, there is one of the exhibition of Pacific Standard Times, uh, the Huntington, which is a wonderful exhibition, and I encourage you to go and see also that show. And uh, they have their chronicles, and they have this uh, beautiful drawing of a pineapple, which is I, I, I it, when I saw that, you know, it's a, and, uh, very uh, Fernandez de Oviedo uh, book. And uh, I was thinking of the Galeotto Che description of the pineapple. So it's, he, he, he did this really kind of kid-like drawing of a pineapple. And then he, uh, Che mentions, uh, you know, uh, Fernandez de Oviedo mentions this pineapple as an extraordinary thing from the new world, a new thing which is beautiful, it's so strange. And then, kind of on a more practical side, uh, Che describes the pineapple, this wonderful, strange flavor, and but warns, don't eat too much pineapple because you can <laughs> have like trouble if you eat much pineapple. And this ambivalence, I think, is, is, is key to understand the problem and how to face uh, uh, this, this imposing order on something that is unknown. And, and, and probably Cristobal have some kind of, um, some vision on, on, on how the pre-Columbian past emerged as, a, as an answer somehow of, uh, because if you are incorporating elements of the past uh, in, in this 19th century city, you are kind of bridging kind of the long history of the region. Yeah, well, there are so many issues. Uh, you just out. go to one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, talking about continuity and the perpetuation of symbols, 
I think that what is very interesting is that a uh, national symbol such as Cuauhtémoc was like perpetuated through the decades since the 1870s until the 1920s. But what is very interesting is that those a symbol like, like Cuauhtémoc was subverted at the uh, Secretary of Education, I mean, by Diego Rivera in 1924. I mean, one of the greatest uh, achievements of Rivera was like uh, combine the official discourse with the uh, with other meanings that they, they can uh, they can um, they can have. So that's something that was mobilizing. I mean, was that in the 1920s uh, the Colombian past changed it in so many ways. I mean, there were new offices for administrative um, for like uh, for study this um, ancient heritage and also publications. And we cannot forget those landmark books such as uh, Manuel Gamio, La Población del Valle de Tehuacán, which was like from 1923. And so there's so many interests that the um, in the Colombian past uh, created abroad. I mean, of course, in the 19th century, there were tons of excavations and foreign investment on and working uh, on the um, on these sculptures and ancient temples, but of course in in the 1920s there was like a boom, and we can prove that with the many expressions that emerged here in California as well, you know. And mm -hmm. this there is a an exhibition at LACMA that also shows that those exchanges. And here at the Metropolis uh, exhibition we have a, a Stacy Jo drawing that also connects. A tradition of drawing that may, it's very as well, not very similar, but it, it is in dialogue with Mujica's drawings mm -hmm. in some way. I mean, in terms that they were imagining an utopian vision of a city of architecture through these uh, ancient forms, and yeah, I don't know. I, I, the others, I mean, if the other speakers wants to mm. comment, please. Mm -hmm. I, I would like to comment something that I, I think is, is really key to understand uh, the whole uh, process of urbanization in the Americas is that uh, when the whole process started, we are facing a change of dynasty in Spain. You know, the house of Trastamara is, is really is the end. And then we have the Habsburg coming in and is is really, uh, the city is civil, so we have this new order that is coming to the city, which is Seville, which is the entry way to the new world. So it's, it's not only the Spanish Empire that is trying to, to, to kind of restructure itself. And, uh, and they, they have some kind of practice on the Canary Islands. They were kind of trying to try the different modes, how to conquer and organize the territory. But it's, it's really in the south of Spain that they really had to set up the whole structure. Almost at the same time, they are kind of, uh, you know, conquering an entire continent. So that really shaped the experience of the Americas. Mm -hmm. It's in inform it's in the towns. It's interesting that you point out, I mean, the role of some of the Spanish cities, I mean, of course, and Sevilla becoming so relevant. I mean, of course, I mean, when we selected in the exhibition the, the exposition of 1929, it was more to see how the Latin American uh, countries responded, but in fact, there is also the reverse message. Sevilla is the city that goes, I mean, from Spain towards Latin America. I mean, mm -hmm. you made it very clear also with some of the images, uh, Jorge, about how Sevilla is a, a, a crucial moment of contact and expert transfer, if I can use this word. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I, I, I have a question before we open up yeah. to the public. Uh, for Cristina and Arturo. Uh, we talked about uh, the impact of uh, the abolish, abolition of slavery in Rio. Um, in Brazil. <laughs> oh, in Brazil, yes. but specifically in, in, in Rio, Rio in this yes, case. Yes, sure. um, And also that has an impact in, the, in urbanism. Mm -hmm. And we, what we haven't talked about is what happens, for example, with uh, the changes uh, Avenida Central and how uh, this is kind of like the beginning of the favelas. Yes, mm. yes. So um, could, could right. you talk about that? Could you yes. talk about the displacement of people, the destruction of the colonial 
centers in, in yes. cities like Buenos Aires and Rio. Obviously, mm. not, we're not talking about mm. uh, a city like Mexico City, but or, or the small one. I mean, Would Lima. you like to start, Christina? Uh, yes, I can. Uh -huh. uh, you right, Idui. Uh, I was uh, uh, in my uh, in my speech. I talk about the high income. Uh, classes. I talked about the medium classes, but I have not talked about what happened with the people that live it at the center of the city in slums, and uh, they well, at that time they were uh, part of them went to the suburbs, and it was the time that they begin to occupy the, uh, the mounts, but... The hills. Excuse me? All the hills. Yes, the hills. But it was very, very, uh, it was very the beginning of this process. So, uh, they, they went to the suburbs, but they stayed in the city, and then uh, they start to occupy the hills. Uh, so, this is... Uh, uh, what I was willing to, to show is that this is, uh, this is a, mo a movement that, uh, that uh, articulate all the uh, social, uh, social classes, in the income classes. You see, you have the, because at that time, the higher income classes were in the center of the, the city. So they start to go to the south. The middle class that was beginning to appear at that time were, they remained in the, the center of the city and part of them started to go to the suburbs. And there was really a great part of the population that was, were in the center of the city that started to go to the favelas, that formed the favelas, that was the occupation of the hills, and also they went to do... So this is a time when the city is completely changing. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, this is a, a, a key point as well. Uh, I, I would add to what Christina was saying that, um, yes, I mean, you, you had these displacements from uh, the province, from England, into the cities, uh, so you have to some extent these pockets of... of uh, of migration that, yes, was located in the city, especially in the centers, because we, we tend to think nowadays of favelas and this sort of marginal city uh, in the outskirts, but it was really, it was in the center that was going through a process of, uh, of what we call in Spanish, tourization, no? Uh, the conventillos, the crowded center, etc. And in this respect, some of the reforms that we, we talked about today, uh, Pereira, Pasos in Rio, uh, thing, I think, and to some extent, um, Torcuato de Alvear in Buenos Aires. Uh, these reforms, to some extent, sort of displaced the problem, hid it, uh, uh, hid it from, from the sort of the public domain that they were to, uh, mm. what, what Vicuña Maquena called in Santiago. Vicuña Maquena was the mayor in Santiago in the 1870s. And he, he defined a concept which was very uh, politically incorrect but it was very illustrative of the antinomy that I was referring to. He called of the ciudad propia. The, the, the ciudad propia is what he wanted to deal with. The, the rest was the arrabal, oh. the, the, the periphery, and it, do, very, it didn't matter. Very bad room. <laughs> exactly, it was terrible, but it was very uh, illustrative of, of what the, the problem was. So in that respect, it has some analogy as well with the, with the Osman process in Paris. I mean, it was in the long term, uh, uh, you know, of course, the context was were different, but another difference I think in Latin America in relation to this topic of of the um, of the marginality as well as we will call it later, is that the, we we must bear in mind that the the um, the housing question as a public matter did, was not assumed until much later, uh, and partly because. I think the, the, the industrialization in Latin America is less dramatic than in Europe and in, and in, North, Ameri in North America, where I think 
uh, both processes were sort of concomitant, well, simultaneous, especially Britain a bit was traumatic, of course, but to some extent there was a quicker response from the state by the late 19th century taking on the question of public housing. Whereas in Latin America, well, the, 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 the revolution, well, the industrial changes were slower. And, 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 and the, the assumption of the state, by the state of the, of the housing question will take on, on a local base mainly until the 1910s, 1920s. And as a national question will take much longer. More time. Mm -hmm. Okay, much more time. So all this is a, is a significant difference, I think, to yeah. understand our process in relation to... And that also makes a big difference with what's happening in Europe, where Indeed. the housing question, Amsterdam, Berlin, I mean, it's really the beginning of the 20th century. Yeah. No, definitely. Okay, so we have five minutes, so... <laughs> yeah, not much. There is okay, a question. Okay, there's a question there. Yes. And a question there. And another there. one. And a third one. Okay, right. good. Yes. I have a, um, an idea. Oh, if, you, if you can build a, um, a, an area, let's start here, you have to have a um, concentration of those. So, how do you make the modernization of the city with the concentration of power in our territories? I mean, the Porfirio is Porfirio, mm -hmm. but people like, like uh, Andrea, people like Pereira, People like Mackenna, I mean, they have to have the power to do what they have to do. So, dictatorship or concentration of power, non democracy, was part of the world of the world. Good point. I mean, I you yes, want to comment. Do you want to yes. comment on technocrats? <laughs> well, yes, it's a fundamental one, exactly. And you have developed that in your own uh, literary about, uh, literature about this. Yes, this, this concentration of power as it was as well in some, I mean, in, in, in the case of Osman and the Second Empire. But it was strongly, in, in a more evident way perhaps in Latin America, yes. Uh, the, the point is that um, we, we have to distinguish, to some extent, I think, the, the, the local concentration of power, figures like, for instance, Vicuña in, in Santiago, um, uh, Alvear in Buenos Aires, of course, and Pereira, eventually, in Rio in the Belle Epoque. Um, from the uh, sort of the figure, which is very interesting in Latin America, of the, of the president, or overtly the dictator who had also an urban project. Uh, uh, and in this case, for instance, Guzman Blanco in Caracas is emblematic. I mean, Guzman yeah. was the president, and yet he was also the mayor. I mean, he has his ideas about the city, uh, about how to, to uh, sort of refurbish the, the, the rooms, the theater, everything. I mean, it was incredible how he had this urban vision. And another case that I find interesting in, in, uh, in that respect is um, Estrada Cabrera in, in Guatemala, who, who he's labeled, yes, as a dictator, a very centralized regime a bit later. Um, uh, but until the 1920s in Guatemala, but he had uh, uh, an urban project, very evident as well, and all the imaginary and exhibition and so forth pass from his view of, of that. So yes, it is clear. Well, let's have the other questions. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And I wonder if there is a, a tension yeah. that reflects a tension between yeah. two different groups, if there is a, a world of symbols. Yes, uh, well, I talk about that a little, just very briefly. Briefly, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but it's very interesting, thank you. Because the project of the Monument of Columbus was not uh, por um, sponsored by Porf Porfirio Diaz. I mean, it was finished during the first year of Porfirio Diaz's tenure. But since it was, uh, there was any, nothing to do, I mean, it was already in process. So that's why Porfirio Diaz built uh, <laughs> the Cuauhtémoc, I mean, oh, in order to contest <laughs> Christ, Christo, uh, Christopher Columbus' monument. But it, yeah, it's re really interesting. 
And, well, I didn't mention all the rest of the monuments of Paso de Reforma, but there were so many, and they were creating like a historical narrative through the whole avenue that, uh, you know, uh, finished with the Angel of Independence, built in 1910, and that was the last monument of the Porfiriato. Right. Um, I have another question over there. Thank you. Lynn. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, sorry. government level and the national level, extol people extolling you know, national sovereignty as Mexicans, but at the same time, you still have people who came here who probably identify just as much as, say, Mexicans as, as um, people yeah. from uh, other, other countries who came in. And what was the question? So the, the question, I think, is <laughs> that uh, <laughs> Cuauhtémoc didn't uh, embody all the people that are in Mexico. Okay, so it was that problematic? Yeah, um, yeah well, I mean, people too, from, too. right? I, yeah, yeah. I think I got it like that, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it's not a symbol for everybody in terms of race. Yeah. I think you're, I think it's, no, you're okay. talking yeah. about that. Thank you, Oaxaca yeah. people. Well, actually, Cuauhtémoc uh, is a figure that uh, in the late 19th century went beyond the state. I didn't mention that. I only mentioned how the state instrumentalized the symbol. But of, since Cuauhtémoc was like really a symbol I mean, before Porfiriato, uh, but exalted in Porfiriato, he became a figure also um, th that uh, some in, uh, private entrepreneurs used it. And th that was in, the, in 1896, was created as Cervecería, a beer company called Cuauhtémoc, which produced a lot, a lot of, um, beer for like everyone. So that speaks about how the symbol became very powerful. And the image of the company was the statue in, of Reforma. So that, I think, uh, creates an idea of which are the official, uh, about, about how the official national symbols uh, belong to, to the political project, but also they, they have another life. They mm -hmm. can be instrumentalized in other ways. I don't know if that answers to your question, but... <laughs> we have time for one last question, I, I, yeah. I want to add something that I think is very important, is that this Cuauhtémoc is not a 19th century, you know, uh, phenomenon in Mexico. Yeah. Since, since the late 1600s, we see in Mexican art the emergence of uh, the pre-Hispanic past. Uh, there is this very famous portrait uh, now at the Uffizi in Florence. And uh, along the 18th century, particularly in the late 18th century, we, we see this search for national identity, it is and this association with the pre-Hispanic past. And then that is translated into this moment in the 19th century, early 20th century, in which that, that those ideas really uh, flourish in, a, in an, another dimension. And that, that probably can help you to understand your, your question. Yeah. Um, One last question. OK. Uh, oh, those, here you can. Sorry. A brief comment and a question. The first question is related to ones that have been asked before. Is in terms of the, the Buenos Aires and um, Rio de Janeiro, how the reforms uh, deal not just with the impoverished population that later on went on to live on the favelas or the low income barriers, but the working class, for mm -hmm. example, in Rio de Janeiro and all the road to the coast that was related to the coffee export. That's one, if you can elaborate on that. Not just the most impoverished people, but popular segments of population. How these projects were all the time kind of unfinished. 
they were able to transform the city to a certain extent. Uh, I remember the case of Mexico City in which uh, the, uh, in Porfirio Diaz's time, the main uh, reforms were took place in the surroundings besides Avenida de la Reforma, not in the downtown as far as I know where most of the low income uh, workers live even to this day. Uh, the second question is related to uh, to the role of uh, the Aztec in the imagery of uh, national identity that uh, I think that the interesting, question, interesting issue that you raise is that uh, it was Porfirio Diaz, the first uh, person who has the power and resources to make this long time ideal of uh, Mexican identity identified with the Aztec, uh, who was able to make it. But as uh, one of the presenters mentioned uh, a minute ago, uh, the Aztec was in the uh, wasn't at the center of Mexican identity since even before the independence. There was a famous historian, uh, Francisco Javier Clavijero, who is the one who started to create this idea of the pre-Columbian past. Uh, and I finish with this. Uh, but there is always a counterpoint. And the counterpoint in this period was um, Vasconcelos. Uh, it, I didn't realize that, and you mentioned it, his project, uh, to represent Mexico in one of these uh, fairs was not to build a pre-Hispanic uh, monument, but a colonial uh, sort of architectural example. And he was proposing the idea of mestizaje. Uh, 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 we don't have much time, so yeah, okay, please sorry. tell us what the question is. Yeah, I, <laughs> it was just well, a comment. Sorry, if you can elaborate sorry but we we'll run out of time. Okay. I don't know. Well, that's what I said about Vasconcelos, just precisely that yeah. he was interested in to, uh, that Vasconcelos was interested in to like, create an um, idea of mestizaje through this uh, Spanish uh, colonial architecture. So, and about uh, the Aztec as the official culture, of course, it existed long before uh, Porfir Porfirio Diaz, but I mean, the infrastructure that, that was created for study and administrate the ecological past uh, as Porfirio Diaz uh, did, I mean, as he created, was not existed before. I mean, before that, there were so many attempts to demonstrate like um, national identity in so many ways, of course, using peculiar figures. But I think that the main thing change that, that, that occurred during the Porfiriato was the infrastructure to administrate it, control it, and study it. Well, it seems to me that there is a, a, quite an apparatus of ideas that we need to develop. I mean, yeah. <laughs> and I, the few questions we had, basically, they, under, they make understanding mean, that, sure. that there is a literature to create around, I mean, and a scholarship around those topics. Mm -hmm. I don't know. What do you think, Idura? Well, we're working on it. We're working on <laughs> it. Yes, yes. But uh, th thank you. Mm -hmm. and, um, we run out of time, but maybe if you have a specific question, you can approach the speakers. Um, and I hope that you'll stay for the second session in the afternoon. We'll see you here at 2 o'clock. No, 2.30. 2.30. Oh, well, we have plenty of time.